Hello, welcome to our webinar. Are you ready for the next supply disruption? I'm Elizabeth Heichler, Editorial Director at MIT Sloan Management Review, and I'll be your moderator. This free webinar is made possible with support from our sponsor, Amazon Business. The topic that's brought us here today is supply disruption. In the wake of historic pandemic-driven supply disruption, many supply chain managers are looking to bolster their risk management protocols and tools. Our speakers today believe that these managers should really be prioritizing the systematic development of capabilities to manage for supply disruptions. They need dramatically better capabilities to manage unknown but knowable threats and their associated consequences. Based on their research into how organizations experience and respond to supply disruptions, our speakers have identified six capabilities which make up their ADAPT framework. Here with us today to explain their framework are Johnny Rungtusanatha and David Johnston, both professors of operations management and information systems at the Schulich School of Business, York University. Johnny is the Canada Research Chair in Supply Chain Management, Tier 1, and David is the Research Chair and Director of the George Weston Limited Center for Sustainable Supply Chains. Welcome, Johnny and David. Thank you, Elizabeth. That was great. Um, and welcome to everybody who's on the webinar today. Thank you, Elizabeth. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I see we have over 160 uh, attendees. So looking forward to uh, sharing our insights and, uh, and, and, and an engaging conversation. Um, the title of our presentation is, you know, pretty much uh, a question, you know, are you folks really ready for the next supply disruption? And if you don't, if the answer is no, then perhaps this ADAPT framework that we'll be highlighting may be a useful starting point. Liz has done a wonderful job of introducing who we are, so let's go ahead and not reintroduce ourselves and dive right into the topic. We have a simple agenda, four questions. We're gonna ask first, what exactly is a supply disruption? And what is a supply disruption trigger? Then we're gonna dive into why may traditional risk management uh, approaches and systems be inadequate? Then we'll go into the actual, what is the ADAPT framework? And then we'll end by providing four additional pieces of advice for you to actually think about as you manage for the next supply disruption. So let's start with a formal definition or let's start with a definition of what is a supply disruption. And to answer that question, perhaps it might be useful to recall this commercial from IBM many, many years ago. Where are my socks? If I don't get those socks, I'm out of business. Did you check all your stocks? There's no socks in my stocks. Check down by the docks. I'm the docks. There's no socks. I've checked every box. There's no box full of socks. Forget about socks. I just saw hawks. We got locks. We got frocks. Not frocks, not walks, not locks, just socks. You have got your clocks. Supply chain problems? IBM has internet solutions. Sure, play my socks. So in no way at all how David or myself employees of IBM, uh, nor is this really IBM today, but this was actually a commercial that IBM uh, did in the 80s. And this is gonna be one of the key insights hopefully that you would take away, which is that Supply disruptions, this is not something new. It's been with us for as long as we trade it, okay? The current emphasis on insurance supply disruption may have been exacerbated by COVID-19, but even before COVID-19, we were already facing unprecedented instances of you know, materials being disrupted, goods being disrupted. So more formally, think of a supply disruption if you were company, a company called Z, if you were Z, a supply disruption is actually any interruption in the planned physical flow of goods and services from the supply base that affects your ability to then perform your plan activities. So what that really means is that whatever you expected to flow from one point in the supply base to another, from third tier to second tier, from second tier to first tier, from first tier to you, 
is not the plant flow rate that you were actually working on. You're actually getting less than what you actually anticipated. Now, it's also important to understand that the reason why ZU are disrupted is because you do not have enough buffer inventory or capacity. In other words, if you actually have enough buffer capacity inventory to basically not stop what you need to do, then you don't actually have a supply disruption. And this is why it's important to understand that a supply disruption is really an interruption in the flow. And as long as you have excess capacity and inventory, then your flow, the flow of goods to you, will not be interrupted because you can continue to execute on your plan activities. And when a supply disruption does occur for you, it means that you actually have some ambiguity, either with respect to order quantity, timing of order quantity, both, but in the end, when this happens, you are not able to achieve what we call right six. And by right six, we mean, let's assume that there is demand for a product or service. In other words, we're not dealing with marketing here. We know that your product or service actually sells. A supply disruption occurs when you are not able to deliver your product or service to the right customer in the right quantity, at the right quality, with the right quality, at the right time, in the right place, or at the right cost if you are an accountant or right price if you're marketing. So what then is a supply disruption trigger? Now that we understand the supply disruption itself is the actual interruption. David? Thank you, Johnny. Uh, so I think the thing that we really need to get clear here is, is what we really wanna get down to in anticipating and being able to manage the next disruption is understanding known and, un and unknown but knowable supply disruption triggers. The trigger of an event that we would call supply disruption uh, may not impact your firm depending on what you do and what you've done in the past to be prepared. Uh, but a trigger, and that's one of the things you need to understand is that basically the triggers of these events or disruptions are, are the, the, the root causes of, of the disruption and knowing what they are uh, will determine, of course, whether how you need to respond to them. And hopefully you're not having to respond to them uh, as the uh, disruptive event is actually occurring. Um, and we know there's been lots of disruptive events, as Johnny alluded to, as indicated in the slide that's here. We've always had supply chain disruptions in the past. And of course, what's more vivid for us is, of course, the more recent past. Of course, we've gone through the uh, COVID-19 experience collectively together, and we've all experienced having shortages of toilet paper, uh, shortages of critical electronic parts, uh, shortages of even the raw materials uh, that are involved with all those items. And of course, we've had disruptions when things like the Suez Canal was blocked by a tanker turning sideways. And of course, in Canada and other parts of the world, we've had, a, had disruptions due to uh, political unrest or, uh, or in some cases, a direct conflict, conflict such as the uh, uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, the key thing here is to focus on what's triggering those disruptions. And that's really taking a root cause approach to, to understanding disruption. And when you look at how you would classify these root causes or triggers of disruption that lead to disruptive events and the consequence Johnny just told you about. The classic way, of course, we deal with it from a risk management point of view is something that looks like this, where we have on uh, two dimensions we look at, which is the supply disruptions probability of happening. And then we look at the expected loss. So it's a very consequence based bit of analysis, right? And in theory, we can do this like an actuarial ac exercise, right? We did that the expected value or expected disruption or impact on, on, our, uh, on, on the economics of what we do based upon some sort of calculation of the probability times the expected loss. And we can categorize the various root causes or triggers of those disruptions uh, in terms of their probability of happening and expected loss. Now, what we're going to suggest to you, as suggested by our agenda today, is this is inadequate. And we think we have a better way of doing that called the ADAPT framework. 
And let me just kind of go back to our classic risk management uh, framework here and just look at how the different kinds of risks or categories of risk are handled uh, traditionally. Now, uh, for the situations where there's low probability of happening and there's a very low expected loss, um, you know, we usually tend to ignore that those kind of cat those kind of uh, of uh, of risks, right? And you know, we don't worry too much about the triggers. We expect we have the ability in our organization to scramble and overcome those, or it's part of the flexibility of our employees and our and our technology to accommodate that. So we're pretty good with those kind of uh, of, of risks and our ability to do that. And we usually don't do much about it. Um, if we look at the situations where we have a high probability of risk, now some of them are relatively low in terms of their expected loss, and uh, some of them are, are relatively high. For the ones that basically uh, have, a, have a high probability of, of happening, uh, but they're relatively low, um, we're a bit concerned of that, of course, in supply chain management, because if that happens a lot, which is assumed by the probability, uh, it could be like quality control problems. Uh, so we've actually built systems that manage for that kind of risk, for instance, a, a quality in a factory disrupting the flow of product going to the going to the customer. And we seem to be somewhat adequate at doing that uh, if you're a competent firm. Uh, the ones that we tend to focus a lot more on risk management is, of course, the high high that has a high probability of happening and there's big losses for it. And of course, then we risk management is prioritizing those kind of things. And these triggers, though, are very good at dealing with the known or knowable probabilities. Now, the one that we've experienced with COVID-19, our black swan event here, here we have a high, a, uh, the expected loss are relatively high, but the probability of it happening is really low. That's where we get situations where people say well, it's the one in 10 flood, right? Or it's the you know one in a hundred chance of happening kind of things. Those things we're not very good at. And partially it's because we don't understand the triggers. We don't understand the chain of causation that happens forward to those triggers and then spreads to affect various companies in the various sectors in terms of resulting in actual disruption where we have suddenly no product available for customers or no services to deliver because those products are not there. So what we're going to do a little bit with the adaptive is look at that in a little bit more uh, detail uh, right after Johnny gets a little deeper into this idea of uh, how we know and unknow and don't know. So one of the one of the takeaways we hope that you will uh, have today is something that's not in the in the in the article that we where we talk about adapt is to really start augmenting. Uh, the classical way of thinking about risk with uh, the ADAPT framework. And the reason is the following, right? When you're dealing with a known supply disruption trigger, that means that you already know about it, it's happened in the past and you probably have systems in place to actually block and tackle, okay? And if it's something that's actually knowable because you can think through what might occur, then traditional risk management or the ADAPT framework that we're talking about in a sec will do a great job. Okay. Of course, you can't have a known and unknowable, right? And so that's why that not possible red cell means that this situation is some. So this it's a situation where basically there's nothing, nothing, not much you can do, perhaps other than, you know. You know, pray. Now, when a supply disruption is unknown, has never occurred, but you can actually think about it and imagine it, and therefore it's knowable, then. There are three specific capabilities, anticipate, detect, diagnose, that will be helpful as you think about managing for supply disruptions. As, to, as opposed to a supply disruption that is unknown but unknowable, in which case the capabilities that are very important for you, for your company, as you think about managing for the next supply disruption is really how do you detect quickly? How do you diagnose efficiently? And then how do you act activate and react to quickly? So with that, let me go ahead and introduce the ADAPT framework. The ADAPT framework is really six different capabilities that are symbiotic in nature, in the sense that they reinforce one another. 
The full description of the ADAPT framework is actually in volume 64, issue two of the Sloan Management Review. And we invite all of you to actually pick up and have a, if you have a chance to actually uh, read the article. Here today, I'm just gonna very quickly introduce the meaning of the, we're gonna very quickly introduce the meaning of the six capabilities. Let's start with anticipate. Anticipate is actually a systematic ability to, do you remember that you actually experienced this in the past? and the ability to actually foresee something, some event that you know could end up causing an interruption of flow of goods and services to your organization. It hasn't happened yet, but you know that if it were to happen, when it were to happen, you would actually experience an interruption. That's anticipation capability. The detect capability, hey, do you know when something bad has happened? ideally at the exact moment in time when it did occur. Did you know that this trigger, which will interrupt physical flow of goods and services to your organization, occurred? That's the tech capability. Diagnose is, do you really understand what happened? Holistically, in terms of what was the exact nature of the risk that actually caused flows to be interrupted? What is the actual interruption itself? How many units are no longer flowing relative to the plan rate? What are the options to actually restore, restore the plan flow rate to what, restore the actual flow rate to what you had planned for? Now, let me take over from Johnny here. Activation. This is where, of course, what we've most organizations have as visible uh, attempts to manage disruption. Here's where it becomes very clear that we've got to mobilize employees, suppliers, emerging, and also suppliers. And let's be clear, your ability to execute well here is a function of having good management practice and systems in place, scrambling to re reinvent how to manage the company effectively with capabilities, which have long lead times such as implementing information SIPs information systems is probably not ideal. It's a kind of like a trying to repair the airplane when it's going into a, a nosedive, it's a little too late. Uh, the company that was in our article, Loblaws, was fortunate that they had made investments in demand sensing and responding and the responding systems such as inventory control systems that they had routines ready to be activated when uh, the, uh, the triggers manifest themselves into a, a disruption. Um, the fourth capability, uh, protection, um, the key here is to basically to facilitate what we would call systematic learning about past disruptive events, regardless of whether they happen to you or they happen to maybe one of your competitors or somebody in other industries. So often these triggers, of course, impact other organized industries. So these are learning opportunities. You know, this is where a good case study can be a powerful thing as a centerpiece for maybe doing a scenario uh, exercise or war game type exercise to see what impact that uh, disruption and its triggering event would have on, on your uh, critical assets. And that critical asset could be also just your reputation for reliability with customers. Um, the final capability is, is track. And, and one thing we'd emphasize, of course, is you can approach our whole six capabilities starting in the circle anywhere you want, because they're all interrelated and they overlap with each other as you would expect. But finally, with the track, what we want is data that allows us to provide tripwires and, er and an early warning of emerging threats. This is more than just creating a dashboard. It includes routines as to how uh, the insights uh, uh, are going to incorporate, be incorporated into managerial decision making. It's just not enough that you basically collect the data that somebody can make sense of it. So, you know, it's, it's not great when the, uh, it, it, you know, that when you have a smoke alarm and it goes off and it's correctly detected, there's a fire, but there's no one around to hear it and to respond to, uh, to the warning and your house burns down. So we'll talk a little bit more about this aspect of, of, uh, of managing for the next supply disruption a little later on. And we now have a poll here, and uh, now we'll ask uh, our uh, folks administrating the webinar to uh, help us out on that. So 
right off the bat, I'm going to get Johnny to respond first to this, but I would notice that anticipate seems to be the favorite by 53% of the people responding, and then a distant third followed by uh, the capability to diagnose uh, potential uh, disruptions and identify triggers. Johnny, any reaction to this? It is not surprising that the audience pick anticipate capability as the capability that is most lacking. And the reason is that it's not surprising because it is probably the, um, the one capability that organizations don't really think about because it's investing in something that actually hasn't happened, right? For example, uh, one of the points I always uh, make with companies is, do you have somebody who just reads the news and does nothing but read the news and then brings it to your attention? And often the answer is no, because why? There's no ROI on that, right? So anticipate being a capability that most organizations lack is also the one and one capability that most organizations must consciously budget for, okay? Budget for. This is one of the key takeaways from uh, our research and from our discussion is that if anything else, okay, if you need to actually plan for developing these capabilities, anticipation is one of the capabilities that must be a focus, okay, long term, short term, consistently over time, if we really, really want to be able to manage better for the next supply disruption. Um, so we you can find a lot of this already in the article. And of course, some of the things you've just identified in your poll, we are working on in our research, ongoing research on this topic. But let's now give you some, some advice that isn't in the article as extra value for you being here today. And we'll start off with, and we're gonna call them tips for now. Um, and I'll start off, Johnny will come in with a few more at the uh, later. So tip one is how do we deal with this idea? Should we adapt or should we try to avoid as a strategy for dealing with supply disruption? Well, we had a great example of how it's very hard to avoid disruption and the triggers and, 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 and it, or even though we identify the triggers uh, We've been exposed to the triggers uh, long before the events that caused the disruption. So last week across North America, we experienced wildfires that basically, in the case of Canada, blanketed pretty well the whole country, the majority of the population there. In, in the past, we did have forest fires that caused supply disruption where there's road closures, air quality warnings, uh, and, and uh, restrictions on employment activity, and of course, even evacuations. Uh, but then... Of course, last week they were they were uh, experienced across uh, the whole country and have it had a significant impact on economic activity and, and, and public health. And of course, we did know these uh, these are potential triggers of reception uh, of sorry of disruption. Um, but what I think we'd experienced was what the systematic effect of it is when it becomes widespread. And of course, the root triggers is climate change. Uh, and all the things that have rippled down from it. And of course, when it, uh, uh, a trigger, it has a potential of being systematic, system-wide, uh, to be a system-wide disruption, of course, there's nowhere place to run uh, and hide. All you can do is now start thinking about adaptation strategies. And a couple we mentioned in our article is basically a playbook, you know, thinking of some of those scenarios and figuring out how you're going to cope with, with uh, the disruption. Um, and you, you do actually think about this issues about, you know, should we actually have one fact, only one factory or one supplier or one depot in an area, uh, in one geographic region, if you're going to be having uh, uh, problems with, uh, with forest fires and flooding and that sort of thing. And, and the conclusion you have is, um, yeah, maybe you should, but also you might start thinking about, is there things we need to do our facility if it's unavoidable? Um, the other aspect of this, of course, of adaption versus avoidance, and we're suggesting that basically, yes, these are both viable strategies, not either or. Um, there's a few bad assumptions that, that people make when they're thinking about how to adapt as a strategy. Um, one of the things is, is that everybody actually who needs to be informed is informed about what those triggers are and what their consequences are. And they all get the uh, same information at the same time when 
an event happens and of course they now start scrambling to do something else of course that's not what happens companies that are such as the one that we examined in our our article of course um, had thought a little bit beforehand about uh, who it needs to be informed that's often in the playbook that they have for emergence and response and risk management and they thought about who gets what information at what time uh, the other um, thing is, of course, that the supporting data is available. And of course, that's an important thing that we talk about in the actual DAPS framework is that basically you need to have that data um, flow uh, set up beforehand and that it's accurate, it's timely, and it's secure. And that last point about whether it's secure is really important. Um, as we know, uh, sometimes we have to deal not only in the uh, after an event is triggered with basically the consequence of whether it's a natural disaster or it's trying to work around something like a political conflict or a, uh, a, a trade conflict. Um, sometimes we also have, you know, irrational behavior where people don't think through the consequence, they panic, they do splurge buying. Um, and of course, increasingly we deal with people that are bad actors who like to intercede to do, uh, you know, uh, uh, cybersecurity uh, attacks and that sort of thing that can complicate your ability to adapt to um, a supply disruption. And this, these are things that you have to build into your playbook and into your contingency planning uh, and have your folks ready to respond to that. And of course, the final thing is that's very topical right now, particularly over the last six months is of course, um, will they, or are we simply just going to have an AI that does somehow they involves with some sort of machine learning that's going to be able to allow us to adapt very quickly to uh, variations in, in supply and demand in our network. And the reality of course, as you know, AI is basically has to be trained. And if you have black swan events happening uh, where your data has never, uh, that you've collected never includes uh, the impact of disruption, of course, your AI, of course, does not have the experience basically to help you out much. Uh, does some of the things that companies have done in their digitalization been effective, say, during COVID-19? Definitely. And the company that was in our article, which was Loblaws, a food retailer up here in Canada, um, it was. It, it handled many of the routine decision makings at scale. So think of the thousands of items that could be disrupted during COVID-19. And if you tried to forecast and manage them all at the same time, it would be a very complicated task. So it was more or less to assess, assist the decision makers and to flag where they could act. But it was not necessarily the AI that was doing the adaptation. It was the people. Um, and I think we're over to you, Johnny. Whoops, I'm sorry, one, one last tip from me. Adaptive collaboration is really important. Talk is really cheap, cheap, cheaper and essential when dealing with, with supply disruption. And, you know, I just would pose the question to you. What was the last time, when was the last time you actually, you talked proactively with suppliers and customers about supply chain disruption? It maybe spoils the party to bring this up. But, you know, it's, is it all that, uh, isn't it in your best interest to ask what is their plan to deal with various uh, potentially triggering events? What uh, can they do for you and what you can do for them? And of course, what can they not do? What is, where, they, where do they not have the uh, capacity to adapt? The final question I put to you is, when was the last time you talked to expertise outside the organization and supply chain about supply chain disruption triggers? This was a point Johnny made. You know, there's lots of, and most of you would probably admit that there's a lot of power in having a very strong professional and social network. And of course, one of the things you need to think about when you develop the capability is who will you give voice or who will you listen to that's going to help you anticipate what could be a triggering event to a supply disruption. Johnny, what's your tips? So the last two tips are the following, right? The first is that you need to prioritize your purchases to actually prioritize the actions that you will take. And the reason is that, well, we're all cognitively gonna be constrained, which is why phone numbers have so many digits, why zip codes have so many uh, numbers and alphabetical values. We don't actually have time to focus on everything or control everything. 
But what is important to understand is that you must make time for the most important of everything. And by this, I mean strategic goods, leveraged goods, and bottleneck goods. Strategic goods, of course, being the most important. And the crisis framework actually helps us understand if we don't really have time to focus on everything, how should we think about managing, for example, the strategic goods? And here's an answer. If you have no financial constraint and no physical storage constraint, then by all means, buy up as many units as you want because you have space to put store on and you have money to spend on it. Okay, And you notice that with this particular two by two, we're not going to even consider something called inventory postponed, which is, which is another fancy way of saying that let's just wait. Okay, let's just wait until we know what is needed before we go ahead and spend money buying what we need uh, and, you know, storing what we need. But if you do have financial constraints, but you don't have physical storage constraint, then what we would advocate is something that's called forward consignment. Okay, forward consignment is simply will you work with your supplier where you actually physically have the units of supply on hand, but you do not pay for them until you actually use them. And companies that are thinking about strategic goods, strategic products and supplies that they manage, uh, that they need, and thinking about how best to actually leverage their financial resources, okay, uh, when they have no physical space constraint, might want to pursue this kind of inventory management approach. If on the other hand, you do not have financial constraints, but you do have physical space constraint. This is where the approach of using reverse consignment might be a way for you to prioritize purchases of strategic goods so that you can actually manage stockpiles of inventory appropriately. That's tip number three. For non-critical goods, well, go ahead and postpone. Because by definition, non critical goods are actually widely abundant in the marketplace, easily substitutable, and not too time uh, consuming to actually get your hands on. The last tip, okay? Andrew Carnegie, okay, behind General Motors, okay, once said the best way to become rich is to put all your eggs in one basket and then watch that by basket. Well, of course, Warren Buffett would disagree and say, do not put all your eggs in one basket. In fact, you should diversify. Well, the reality today is that supply chains are actually quite complex. They produce contract products, oftentimes with contract manufacturers or suppliers responsible for major subsystems. So you can imagine the power dynamics in this situation. In fact, because you're dealing with major suppliers, major component suppliers, you probably have fewer suppliers. And that I see that has also been, uh, I guess, motivated by this notion of rationalizing your supply base. So to diversify as a means to reduce your supply, main, supply management risk means the following. Well, for one thing, don't buy everything from the same country, okay? Don't buy everything from the same way. If you can avoid it, not everything you need for your business should be sourced from one country or from China, for lack of a better word, or any particular country. That's, that's not putting all your eggs for everything that you buy. Most manufacturing companies, that's 40% of your cost of goods. Don't make sure that you just don't buy from one country. But if you have no choice, but they're actually single source from far away, then someone who actually works for you needs to be there keeping an eye out for you, okay? We used to call this JIT2 purchasing. And for some reason, we sort of forgotten about that. If you're buying something from one country, everything that you buy from one is a country, then perhaps you need to have an office in that country where you are employing those employees and where they work for you. So with that, I'm just gonna Call it a day, call it in the morning. Thank you very much for taking the time to be with us. Hopefully we've provided you with some nuggets of insights and we're open to any questions that you might have. Great, thank you both so much, David and Johnny. That was really informative. And we have a lot of questions rolling in from the audience. So uh, so we will, uh, let's get going. Um, let's see, uh, Donald Fursad asked, is it fair to say that the framework applies more to the traditional supply chain model 
how do you anticipate changes as additive manufacturing becomes more pervasive in our society? A, a couple of quick thoughts on that one, since he brought up the additive manufacturer, what they call 3D printing sometimes, yeah. um, is, you know, the, 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 the hope here is that you would localize, be able to do localized manufacturing, which would maybe remove some risk factors. Of course, the place where you localize your, your manufacturing too could also be hit by a flood, a fire, um, you know, uh, onerous uh, regulation, all sorts of things that are potentially triggers of disruption. So that being said, the technology to, to the rescue is not the complete solution. Um, now the issue about, I think you, the way you start off, Elizabeth, was whether certain, I think was certain industries, was that the first part of it? Um, well, you know, it, it was really just asking whether, you know, it's, it's the, the sort of the traditional supply, this applies just to, to the traditional model. Um, and whether it would apply to a situation where you're doing more additive manufacturing. Additive manufacturing. Johnny, you got a take on that one? Sure. The promise of additive manufacturing is great. The actualization of the promise isn't there yet. So if you remember uh, initially when I said organizations can buffer themselves from shops upstream if they have excess capacity and excess inventory, well, 3D printing can be thought of as actually providing both excess inventory and inventory excess capacity. That's the promise of 3D printing because it allows you to like print parts at the spur of the moment should some part that you're supposed to be getting does not arrive on time. But the reality is that if you look at 3D printing or additive manufacturing today is that we're still in the early stages of developing that technology. Why? Because the material science that needs to go hand in hand with 3D printing is not progressing fast enough to the point where, for all of us Star Trek fans out there, remember when we can say computer, cappuccino, you know, uh, no froth, okay, two sugars, no cream, and out of thin air, okay, you know, this gadget then produces a nice cup of hot cappuccino for you. That's the promise of 3D printing. We're not there yet. And until we, until we get to that point, we were still going to actually need to think about managing supply disruption and the risk in a manner that hopefully goes beyond just property times expected loss. There's an interesting example of that, of course, within the, uh, the, in the war between Ukraine and, and uh, Russia. Uh, there's an, um, basically a maker's network of 3D print. Uh, manufacturers, smaller hobbyists too, that have suddenly banded together in, a, in a, an informal network that was basically creating drones for the Ukrainian army. And suddenly this capacity came together really quickly, but it's a distributed network, which has some interesting robustness. It's, it's more robust to shock in some cases. It's not one factory, it's many sources, but it seemed to be quite, uh, it was very quick and very agile. And let's see, we have a question from Anna Oliveira, who wonders, um, uh, you know, raises the uh, sort of control tower methodology and supply chain, and is uh, wondering if you can get, kind of explain the, sort of the, a little bit of a difference between that approach and what you're proposing with ADAPT. David, you want to take this or let me take this? Um, you do take a shot. At it. I'm just thinking through one idea I had in response to this one. So the notion of control tower, you know, is mirroring the fact that the AI and the data and all the data is out there. And the idea that with so much data, we're gonna be better, we're gonna have a better shot at uh, monitoring and reacting, okay? But you also have to understand that the control tower means that you have now centralized one point of attack, okay? So in other words, if some nefarious actor decides that they wanna take down your supply chain, they don't have to worry about, you know, who should, you know, which node should I be targeting? All they have to know is where's your control tower. And because the control tower notion is based on the idea of data, disruption in the data will have a wide cascading effect on the entire network, okay? So that's one of the downside of control tower. It's not really a, it's not really a, a different idea than the adapt. It's like, uh, sorry, it's not a complementary. it's actually a different issue, okay? Because even when we talk about activating, we also need to talk about the control tower. One of the Fortune 500 retailers uh, that we actually, um, uh, that we worked with in the past uh, in the US actually has a control room. 
And the control room is, what's the purpose of control room? Control room is that when there's a crisis, we know who to call Ghostbusters. No, we know who to call to be in that room because that control room then has precedence in terms of all decisions because the control room then needs to make sure that we get back to normal as quickly as possible. So it's not an either or. I just want us to understand that the notion of control tower today came out of the digital, you know, digital AI space where we say, if everything is really just data, shouldn't we have a tower that controls the flow of data? So. Yeah, the two the thought I was working on. So that's for, for the questioner, tip one. Um, in, earlier is really relevant. There's, that's your checklist of whether your control tower is going to be effective. Is whether you've con you've got considered these assumptions and your ability to to address them. The second one, I'm reminded of you know back when we had the idea of the lights out factory where everything would be automated and run by by a, a master intelligence, a machine intelligence. Is they have a, a member a cartoon where there's a man sitting in front of a council with a, a screen and a, lots of controls that he and his feet are up on the on the control council and beside him was a dog and and the caption was this what what, what why was the dog there the dog was to bite the man uh, so he didn't touch the controls if he ever got close to them and i don't think we're anywhere near that right now okay Thanks. Now, are there particular industries or types of firms that do better at managing supply disruption? Okay, I think uh, maybe I can address that one a little bit. So, you know, is there something inherent in with them? So there is some research on organizations um, that uh, have looked into under what conditions um, does their various processes and systems have the ability to be, you know, to adjust dynamically. I and mean, they, they, there's a whole literature on what they call dynamic capabilities out there. And there is some um, research that says, well, how much is is the is it a their ability a condition of the environment that they're in that they're basically forced to adapt to their environment by developing this kind of uh, adaptive. A capability and, and get good at it. And the reality is, is actually in, in stable environments, you would assume, well, of course, it might not would be worth their while. So certain industries that are stable, maybe not put the money into it because it's, it's not worth it or, or assign their people to do it. So they tend to be not particularly effective when a, a crisis happens like COVID-19. That's systematic across the board. The other one, of course, is in very volatile industries. Part of the issue is, is you're so under pressure all the time. You, you, you never think to drain the swamp by, you know, you know, to get rid of the alligators that you're trying to deal with, you know, the crises you're trying to deal with. So some of the research suggests those organizations that have, you know, mild levels of threat and, you know, have some disruption, but not, it's not overwhelming, are the best adapted because they, they see the requirement, the need to deal with those um, low and high probability events that, that can have a high impact. Mm -hmm. and, and so they're pretty well set up. So you don't, I think the messaging from this research is if you're in a stable industry, it, the question is how long will it stay stable? So maybe you should be proactive. If you're in a volatile one, you know, where do you get the resources basically to take a, to take a pause or get more people on this so you can get on top of it? And if, you, some, if you're in somewhere in the middle, that's the uh, that maybe is a danger zone because you're kind of left up to there's no driving imperative and there's not the safety of basically nothing is going to change in the near term. So I, I, th I, I think that's probably what you're, you're thinking about, or at least the questioner's thinking about. But some organizations, of course, have adopted the, this, this underlying agility uh, behind it because that's the nature of the high speed, high clock speed industry that they're in. And um, you can see that in, in, the, in the, one, the company that we looked at um, in the Sloan article, mm -hmm. uh, was in the food retailing industry, which moves pretty quickly. Uh, same with uh, things like consumer electronics and uh, and the supplier uh, base for uh, automobiles, for instance. Um, some other industries, the question are they are they too stable to to have adopted the, the some of the elements of the ADAPT framework? That's the interesting question. Okay, thank you. Long well, <laughs> Do you want to add anything on that, Johnny, or should I move on to our next question? I guess the only thing I'll add is that I, we have to be careful to actually think that, you know, there's going to be one company, call it whatever you want, that will never be subject to any supply disruption. 
And this will be part of a question that was already posed on the, in the Q and A. The reality is that every company will actually, every organization will experience a supply, a supply disruption, you know, sooner or later. It's not a question of whether or not, it's a question of when, mm -hmm. okay? And the adaptabilities that we're talking about, hopefully will lessen the severity of the disruption uh, that the organization will face when it does occur, right? So if you really want me to push for an answer like other examples, just look at the industry and ask yourself, which company has existed for the last 100 years? Those are the ones that probably are doing something well, but even then, along the way, they may have faltered, okay? And they have to reinvent themselves, right? So. Okay, now we have a few tactical questions about how to actually execute on some of what you recommended with the framework. Uh, Thomas Bosch in our audience asks, what are your suggestions for successfully mapping your sub-tier suppliers? <laughs> sub-tier suppliers. Yeah. So this is, this is going past the first tier, down to the second, the third and fourth. Maybe you want to find out, um, are your, is your shipment going to be interdicted at the LA port? because you have forced labor uh, uh, created products, that kind of a thing. Um, interesting question. So getting transparency into supply chains is kind of the bleeding edge of supply chain management right now. And of course, one at a time is getting enough data to be able to do that. And of course, we're not only looking at what organizations will supply to them, trying to look for other measures that are more objectively collected about their behavior and then be able to consolidate it into things. And this gets into that where I mentioned the idea of dashboards and analytics systems that can elevate that insight to a certain lot. Right now, the state of the art is often we are one tier. We have one tier transparency um, to things that could be potential triggers of disruption, whether it's, as I mentioned, it could be something to do with human behavior or it could be uh, emerging natural disasters such as you know rising water levels, uh, an early onset of a monsoon in India, or fire, fire, se uh, fire season up in Canada and in the uh, northwest of the United States. Okay. And and I have a similar question about uh, the anticipation capability, since that you know obviously that that is one that uh, as you said many companies need to work on. Can we drill into a, a little bit more about what are some of the the sort of organizational structures and processes that you need to Put in place in order to really make that a more robust capability. Sure. So, so before I get there, let me let me add to that last question a little bit, right? And there's okay. a few cautions I want to actually, you know, remember we talked about prioritizing your purchase to prioritize your associated actions. Yeah. When you talk about mapping your supply chain, you need to actually start at the product level and say, is this a strategic sub component? And if that's the case, yeah, mapping means that you draw out, you know, who the players are as far up the chain as possible. That takes time, mm -hmm. that takes data, but the caution is that as soon as you draw on that, it may have every change, right? Anytime you need new technology, new player, man, that, that's gonna change. So drawing, it's a good exercise to get an understanding of what's going on, but when you make decisions based on that drawing, just make sure that it's actually current. That's the caveat. Now in terms of anticipate, okay? We sort of alluded to one thing, or one, one uh, uh, actionable item or is it? Is there a person or team inside your organization, okay, who, you know, who might be doing market intelligence, okay? Uh, but oftentimes the market intelligence is task-based. And what we suggest is have someone whose job is basically to just think about what's going on in the world and then bring interesting things to your leadership, okay? Um, do you have retreats with, you know, uh, subject matter experts are actually not even related to your current business, mm -hmm. right? I mean, if you if you're a large uh, food producer, okay, don't you want to talk to the farmers to figure out what they're facing? Do they see a drought? Right? I mean, that's what we mean by anticipate. The best you can do anticipate is actually expose your organization to everything else going around you, but have some intelligent capability to basically say hey, this issue is important or interesting. If we start thinking about what may happen, that may lead us to start thinking about how do we block and tackle. Mm -hmm. So anticipate it's a difficult capability because as I said, there's no real ROI that you can tie to it. 
in the short term. It's interesting too. Uh, this brings up an interesting issue about who you listen to, and uh, we had at a conference uh, we just put on uh, last week, and Johnny and I, um, we had the president of the freight forwarding. Uh, Industrial Association that, of course, deals with all how to make these day-to-day -day transactions in, in our supply chain efficient and, and cost-effective. And one of the comments he said, if you're really doing your job, uh, you know, the better you are at the job, the, the more invisible you are. And, of course, people don't think to talk to you about what, it, what, what you're seeing, um, nor do they necessarily make a point of, of, of having conversation with you, right? And those are the people that you have to be proactive and reach out to talk to. You know, what is your interests? You know, what is the dominant interest that you're concerned when you do your Pareto analysis of, of, of risks to your ability to stay in business? You know, who are the people that, that should be, you should be engaging in at the start off with that. Okay. And now we have a number of questions and in various forms, all sort of coalescing around the anxiety about um, advanced inventory. <laughs> People are asking you direct questions that you probably um, wouldn't be able to answer, like how much should we have? Um, which give, is give, people, of but can you give people some guidance about kind of how to think about this problem um, of you know how much uh, how much advanced inventory to balance. You know, one person mentioned you know the risk of obsolescence. Other people um, you know had, had some other 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 concerns and very specific questions. So maybe what are what are some some general resources for um, kind of working through this problem. So the inventory stockpiling or management, you know, opportunity, okay, is a richly researched, lots of practical advice, okay? Uh, unless you have specific numbers, like what is the cost of that something? In other words, how much does it cost, you know, when, pump, when, when a unit of inventory actually no longer is usable? Unless you know what the demand rate is and whether that's changing, whether the, the inventory that's obsolete actually is is substituted or something else, I'm not going to be able to give you a specific number, right? Mm -hmm. But there are ways to think about it, right? There are ways to think about it, including, well, what is the worst case scenario in terms of lead time for that item? Mm -hmm. If it's going to be five weeks, worst case scenario. What is the best case scenario? Two weeks? Well, then... Having enough inventory between two weeks and five weeks is better than having nothing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's why I said some of the 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 nuances when it comes to inventory is going to be context specific, uh, and probably not not something that David or I can actually give you a numerical answer. But there are ways to think about it, and it starts with, as we said, do you have enough money? Like I said, if you have lots of money, well, and you have lots of space, buy as much as you want as long as it's not going to be obsolete, as long as you can use it again and again, right? So this is in some ways reflective of some of the, uh, what we call the uh, common module thinking. Mm -hmm. right? if, you have a, if you have a skill that you know it's going to be used forever, well, it's okay to buy a lot of it because you know it's going to be used forever, right? So for, I think, Bill, I think this was your question. If you want to follow up with us, we can actually have a sidebar conversation on this. But I, there are lots of stuff out there. I don't want to mislead you, and we don't want to mislead you and, and take you in one direction without you know deeper understanding of the situation that you're in. So, okay, and let's uh, let's see. We've got time for one short, let's call it a li lightning round question. Um, and just just a, as a closing note. Um, why did, why is there so much uh, heightened interest in uh, supply chain disruption now? I mean, as David pointed out, the reason why there's interest is because, you know, uh, we're not getting goods and services that we need, right? If we were all content with, if we walked, us in the, uh, walked into an online store, retail, physical store, and we get everything we need, nobody would actually care about supply disruption, right? right? So if we did our jobs well, this is an invisible topic, which is again a reason why, you know, we start out by saying that this is nothing new. We've been dealing with this ever since we started trading, right? right? And trading means, you know, I sell, I give you my coin, you give me your 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 cattle, right? It's at that level, right? We've always had this issue. It's just that when we're doing a good job about it, it doesn't become national news or international news. But when there's a hiccup, that's when it becomes, you know, front page news. So 
supply chains will already stretch thin because of inventory reduction policies. Right. Nobody want to hold inventory. COVID just made things worse right. because it exposed the, 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 the weaknesses in very long stretch thin supply chains. Right. So. And, and another thing was the basic assumption of why you had a supplier in a supply chain is because they're cheap, right? And the cheap and cheerful was a favorite favorite axiom, of course. And, and we were we had supply chains that were vulnerable, that were cheap and cheerful. And only when suddenly availability disappears do you realize that cheap is not the best and only answer. Got it. Well, that is all we have time for. Thank you both so much, David and Johnny. Uh, so it's a really informative, interesting, and a nice compliment to your article, which I hope all of our uh, audience members will, will download and read if you haven't done so already. Um, so thank you for sharing your insights. And uh, I'd also like to thank our sponsor, um, Amazon Business. So uh, thank you all, our audience, for being with us here today. And uh, we hope to see you here again next time. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Elizabeth.